Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the webcast today on Standards for Assistive Technology Funding, What are the Right Criteria? My name is Ann Williams, and I'm with CEDL in Austin, Texas. This webcast is offered through the Center on Knowledge Translation for Disability and Rehabilitation Research, or KTDRR, which is funded by the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research, or NIDR. Our presenters are Jim Leahy and Don Clayback, members of the Working Group on Assistive Technology, sponsored by the Center on KTDRR. The AT Working Group has focused on the emerging requirements of evidence standards affecting the technology transfer of and payment for assistive technologies designed for persons with disabilities. Although the highest level of evidence is produced through randomized control trials, that option is often not feasible when establishing accuracy of effectiveness and assistive technology rehabilitation technologies because so often the solutions provided are unique to an individual. Our presenters will provide more detail on the work of this group and the white paper it has produced. Now I would like to introduce our speakers. James Leahy is co-principal investigator on the NIDR funded Center on, on Knowledge Translation for Technology Transfer or KT for TT at the University of Buffalo. In 1993, he brought 20 years of invention evaluation, product development, and project management experience to the University of Buffalo's Rehabilitation Engineering Research Center on Technology Transfer, or T2RERC. Over the years, he has led the Supply Push Technology Transfer Program and created a corporate collaboration program through which the T2RERC partnered with Fortune 500 companies to improve the accessibility and usability of new mainstream products. He is a patent holder and serves as a technology transfer consultant to assistive technology inventors. Also joining us today is Don Clayback, the Executive Director of the National Coalition for Assistive and Rehab Technology, or NCART. NCART is a National Association of Complex Rehab Technology or CRT providers and manufacturers focusing, or focused on ensuring individuals with disabilities have appropriate access to CRT products and services. In this role, he has responsibility for monitoring, analyzing, reporting, and influencing legislative and regulatory activities. Don has over 25 years of experience in the complex rehab technology and home medical equipment industry as a provider, consultant, and advocate, and is a frequent speaker at state and national conferences. Jim Leahy, are you ready to begin? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ann. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, this is Jim Leahy. Uh, welcome to this KTDRR CEDL webcast. The title of today's webcast is Standards for Assistive Technology Funding, What Are the Right Criteria? The National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research, or NIDR, recently funded the Center on Knowledge Translation for Disability and Rehabilitation Research, or KTDRR. The KTDRR, in turn, created a diverse working group comprised of representatives from five different stakeholder groups whose purpose was defined as delineating the current reimbursement issues and providing suggestions for methodological standards of evidence for assistive technology reimbursement. Each of the working group members is a representative for the respective stakeholder group, AT consumers, AT service providers, AT researchers and methodologists, AT manufacturers and product developers, and AT payers and policy makers. These are the five key groups that comprise the entire system of manufacturing, prescription, application, funding, reimbursement, and efficacy research with, within each field of AT devices and services. During our working group conversations, we discussed the current Medicare coverage of wheel mobility and seating devices, competitive acquisition policy and its impact, the impact of Medicare policy on consumers and industry, and the expected future of Medicaid coverage. In addition, the working group investigated the state of current reimbursement, regulations for assistive technology devices, and explored and interpreted recent changes to healthcare reimbursement policy and documented anticipated changes in healthcare reimbursement with the upcoming implementation of the Healthcare and Education Reconciliation Act of 2010. 
last lastly, the working group was tasked with making recommendations on how to develop a useful and workable outcomes reporting system for assistive technology funding. This time, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the working group members for all their efforts, insights, and knowledge that they brought to the discussion. The working group members were Don Clayback of the National Coalition for Assistive and Rehab Technology, Rita Hostek from Sun Sunrise Medical, Jean Minkle from Independence Care System, Margaret Piper from the Kaiser Permanente Center for Health Research, Roger Smith from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and Resna, and Todd Barak from Western New York Independent Living. Each of these individuals was a representative for their respective stakeholder group. Assistive technology developers, manufacturers, and service providers are facing new requirements to demonstrate supporting evidence about the effectiveness of assistive technology, or AT. The level of evidence being required is comparable to standards of evidence used to support interventions in the medical arena, known as evidence-based medicine. The gold standard for this level of evidence is generally produced through conducting randomized control trials, or RCTs, although other study designs can provide acceptable evidence depending on the clinical situation. Unfortunately, the RERC, excuse me, unfortunately the RCT, or gold standard level of evidence, is often not practical or appropriate to show the true effectiveness of assistive rehabilitation technologies for persons with disabilities. This is because the target populations for most AT devices are small and often widely scattered, making it difficult to find homogeneous groups to participate in studies. Perhaps more importantly, RCTs require control groups who are denied an intervention, creating a potentially unethical situation. How do you provide a power wheelchair to one quadriplegic and deny it to the next for purposes of controlled trial? Nonetheless, as a prerequisite for, per, for use by persons with disabilities, as well as acquisition through third-party payers, evidence of effectiveness is needed to justify funding reimbursement for new and existing assistive technology products. The negative impacts of misapplying these rigorous standards to determine efficacy of AT products has already been felt over the past several years, resulting in reduced access to AT by people with disabilities. Alternative options for evidence of AT effectiveness need to be identified and accepted. Evidence currently consists of peer-reviewed journal articles and case studies documenting the efficacy outcomes of AT devices. This level of evidence certainly supports the medical benefits of and need for AT, given the variability in small populations typically served by assistive technology products, as well as the small business financing that dominates assistive technology developers. Next slide. Uh, however, to demonstrate evidence of AT efficacy, Innovative study designs or widely representative AT product registries could be considered for the future. Persons with disabilities and practitioners want to know what assistive technology devices work best in any given situation. Unless addressed, the lack of documented outcomes may limit future innovation as well as limit access to existing rehabilitation and assistive technologies by those who need it most. While RCTs remain the foci and preference of most evidence-based medicine decision-making bodies, newer applications of methodologies, such as the use of registries or N equals one crossover trials, are surfacing in the literature as alternative research strategies. This corroborates that innovative research methodologies are possible and show some promise for providing the needed justification for future health-related fund funded decision-making. Again, while journal articles and case studies on the efficacy of AT do exist, the need for more rigorous evidence of AT outcomes is still pressing. The lack of evidence of effectiveness continues to apply to most assistive rehabilitation devices, and policy and research bodies still perceive the evidence in the field with apprehension. For example, the wheelchair industry serves as a good representation of the problem. For many people with mobility limitations, a wheelchair is the primary means of mobility. Individualized wheel mobility systems, 
those that are designed and manufactured to meet the specific needs of an individual, are expensive. Approximately 70% of people with long-term disabilities who need these systems are unemployed, and many do not have the discretionary income necessary to afford these systems. Thus, many people who depend on wheelchairs for daily, daily mobility in order to function do not pay for their own systems. Wheelchair pur purchasers rely on a third-party system that funds wheelchairs for many people who require but cannot afford them. Understanding the third-party system and the impact of government policy on the reimbursement of wheel mobility devices is critical to understanding the industry. Providing individualized wheel mobility systems to people who require them in a third-party payment system can be very difficult. Customers' seating and mobility needs must be met in a way that ensures effective mobility, maximizes function and comfort, and maintains or improves health for the users. Manufacturers and suppliers work to meet the needs of the consumer who uses the system, the medical professionals who prescribe them, and the third-party payers who establish a coverage and payment policy for these devices. For a vast majority of persons with long-term mobility limitations, a government-sponsored program provides these benefits. The three major government programs that routinely cover durable medical equipment, of which wheelchairs are a part, are Medicare Part B. This federal medical insurance program is for persons older than 65 and for persons under 65 years of age who have contributed to Social Security and have been unable to work for at least two years due to injury or illness, and it's for persons with chronic kidney failure. Next up is Medicaid. This state-administered medical insurance program is for people or families who are judged indigent based on household income. Eligibility requirements vary by state. However, non-income related variables are also factoring into the decision to provide Medicaid. These variables include whether an individual is pregnant, disabled, blind, or aged. Veterans Administration uh, is the third one. This is a federal medical insurance funding durable medical equipment for veterans. Lastly, there is an, uh, another option, and it is private medical insurance. Private medical insurance is also a significant source of payment for wheelchairs. Many employers offer private insurance in the form of various managed care plans as a benefit to their employees to cover the cost of medical care. Many people who are self-employed or those who do not receive employer-provided plans purchase private insurance out of their own pocket. These policies may or may not include a DME coverage option. Private payment, though infrequently exercised, is always an option for people with mobility impairments who have sufficient discretionary income to pay for wheel mobility systems. In this webcast, we address the issue of the expectation of an evidence-based standard to determine AT product efficacy and the impact of the standard on the transfer, use, and payment for assistive technologies designed for persons with disabilities. Basically, there are five target populations that need a comprehensive AT outcome system. They are AT consumers, AT clinicians and practitioners and suppliers, AT researchers and methodologists, AT manufacturers and product developers, and lastly, AT payers and policymakers. AT consumers, uh, I can switch the slide there, and I'm not sure if you're going to have to edit it out. That's back to it. I'm fine. AT consumers, an individual with a disability has unique personal characteristics, unique environments, and specific activities to which they are applying technology devices and requiring AT services. People with disabilities of all ages, their families, and their caregivers are increasingly in need of personal empowerment to assist in decision-making related to assistive technology devices and services, purchasing and acquisition. It has been documented that currently as much as 40% of AT, primarily low-cost technology, and I can't stress that enough, primarily low-cost technology is purchased by the users themselves. As a medical practice, as medical practice heads towards a more person-centered model, 
individuals will be more involved in their own health care decision making, including using the evidence of effectiveness to select AT devices for their own use. Data are needed to assist them with their product decisions. AT service providers, that is clinicians, practitioners, and suppliers. Currently, objective data to assist with AT product recommendations are sparse and scattered. When studies are published, they are often group studies with norm normative, inferential statistics whose population context may not fit the specialized needs of a client or be too general to be informative. The clinician is often left to rely solely on their own personal expertise and judgment, which may or may not align with the outcome efficacy needed for funding provision. Along with AT consumers, AT service providers who want the best outcome for their patients may be those in the best position to gather needed outcome-based data. AT service providers, uh, again, clinicians, practitioners, and suppliers. Today, objective measures are not systematically available or used. The field needs adequate mechanisms to document AT outcomes for later review or sharing. AT service providers need reliable, systematic, and objective methods for quickly documenting AT-related performance outcomes and making AT outcome inquiries. Contributing to the problem is that service providers lack a standardized terminology for coding AT interventions and outcomes. When combined with barriers in communication due to severe excuse me, due to service-specific terminology, this further complicates consistent and compatible documentation. Ultimately, lack of consistent documentation results in abandonment, inappropriate provision of AT devices, and efficient, inefficient use of resources. It is imperative that AT service providers be a part of designing the solution to address their needs. AT researchers and methodologists. It is the mandate and essential work of AT researchers to provide meaningful assistive technology outcome tools and databases for use by all the aforementioned stakeholders. Three general types of research need to be done. First, safety and effectiveness. For product development, to describe the problem a product is di designed to address and how safely and effectively it addresses the problem. New products need this early evidence. Second, outcome measurements for evidence-based practice. That's for users and clinicians to have objective guidance in determining which interventions are more likely to be successful over time and how they should be used to maximize effectiveness for an individual. For example, power tilt and recline wheelchair seating systems are prescribed to maintain skin integrity. In those tilt recline systems, Users and clinicians need to know the correct angle of tilt recline that the user needs to obtain uh, to produce pressure relief, how often the pressure relief tilt should be performed, and for what duration the pr pressure relief tilt should be maintained to achieve the desired result of the lowest incident of skin breakdown. Three, design, device design and targeted population use. Not all assistive technology works for everyone the same way. While general outcomes knowledge is needed for broad policy decisions, the science of successfully applying assistive technology devices depends on a multitude of variables, many of which might be unique to the individual. Understanding the specific interactions of technology, person, activity, and environmental variables is necessary to match the appropriate technology to the person and situation. AT researchers and methodologists continued. Uh, the need for comprehensive, usable ATO data, assistive technology outcomes data, remains essentially unmet despite strong efforts over several decades. <clears throat> this can be explained by several factors impacting research. They are high variation of needs specific to the specialized nature of AT devices and services that challenge study design, the need for a mechanism to establish functional, functional equivalence or research methodologies to mitigate the need for multiple studies based on diagnosis, age, gender, or other criteria. Funding for AT research that aligns with the needs of policymakers and payers as well as clinical decision makers 
and perhaps most critical, the need to re-examine or examine the best evidence hierarchy that currently guides evidence-based medicine research efforts and subsequent interpretation. It is widely accepted among policymakers that RCTs are the gold standard for evidence in certain areas of healthcare. Population size and variables, even among populations with the same diagnosis, makes RCTs with large numbers of participants impractical, unreasonable, cost prohibitive, and most importantly, may not offer the necessary information to answer the questions policymakers and clinicians making technology recommendations need to have answered. Reasons for this are both theoretical and practical. Consider the recent publication of a meta-analysis on AFOs for individuals post-stroke and that appeared in the Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. The full text of 43 articles was reviewed and 13 trials involving 334 patients that met the inclusion criteria were included. A significant challenge in analyzing these studies occurred secondary to the variety of AFOs. Thus, the meta-analysis needed to select one type of basic AFO for its target. The overall findings said that it appears that this particular standard AFO is beneficial, at least in the short form. The authors go on to say, however, although clinically relevant, it is an insufficient level, it is at an insufficient level to fully inform clinical practice, and many crucial questions remain unanswered. Clinicians need to know the best type of AFO to prescribe, for whom they should be prescribed, the optimal time to prescribe one, how long they should be used, the adverse effects, and the factors influencing acceptability and adherence to their use. It is particularly important that these factors are investigated in the long term because most patients are prescribed an AFO for long-term use. These are complex questions, the answers to which probably differ according to the patient's level of and combination of impairments. Efficacy of research is an issue. The expense and time supporting all the necessary studies and meta-analyses would be substantial. Even when traditional RCTs and meta-analyses are used in the field of AT, products are so keenly individualized that group inferential type methodologies often result in studies with relatively little value. This meta-analysis about AFOs provides little information to help practitioners make better decisions about what AFOs to use in practice, nor does it, in the long run, help other stakeholders make appropriate decisions of major impact. That said, however, studies such as this, based on investments of hundreds of thousands of dollars, could eventually result in third-party funding agencies' willingness to pay for standard AFOs for the specific population. Unfortunately, the number of similarly funded and published investigations can only meet a small fraction of the evidence needs of service providers. Furthermore, the types of evidence secured by classical investigation have lengthy timelines when AT devices are emerging and requiring rapid decision in very short time frames. For example, in a relatively few short months, the entire augmentative and alternative communication, or AEC field, needed to make decisions about how to adopt iPads and other mobile device technologies and fuse them into the AAC decision-making and interventions. Parents were bringing iPads to the clinics with newly installed and untested AEC apps, asking AEC professionals to consider implementing their use. Due to the rapid development of these interventions, no evidence was available to help service providers make appropriate decisions. The only recourse for service providers in this circumstance was to use their best judgment and apply sensible assessments and evaluations in their intermediate intervention planning. To assist researchers, the field needs to consider rapid report research strategies, review and annotate accepted evidence hierarchies as to how they relate to assistive technologies, provide advice around the spectrum of potentially appropriate methodologies, and begin considering widespread implementation of ongoing assistive technology outcome systems. AT manufacturers and product developers. Manufacturers and AT product developers have their own unique needs for AT outcome data. 
manufacturers need guidance from the coverage and payment community with regard to a mechanism to establish effectiveness. There needs to be transparency in the criteria used to determine coverage based on both an agreed upon standard for demonstrating effectiveness as well as pricing and payment methodology. Exasperating the challenge for manufacturers to acquire and cite outcomes data is the fact that the field is extremely small with minimal R&D, testing, financing, or research infrastructure. AT manufacturers need efficient methods for collecting and managing device testing data and obtaining outcomes data. Many research methods require substantial infrastructure. This disenfranchises the AT industry and its ability to compete, not against other companies, but in its survival within a policy structure that requires documented evidence of health-related outcomes, but does little to work with manufacturers and providers to define the nature of the evidence required for individualized products. AT payers and policymakers. These stakeholders rely on the best available evidence provided by researchers. Many indications are showing that evidence-based practice, or EBP, is leading towards evidence-based funding. As the quality and quantity of the evidence is so limited, resulting decisions can be disastrous. Stories are increasingly emerging in which funding agencies have limited or substantially delayed paying for AT devices and services due to the lack of acceptable documented successful outcomes, even when what is considered an acceptable, out acceptable outcome has not been defined or disclosed. A recent example happened in the state of Wisconsin, and it's when Wisconsin Medicaid virtually shut down reimbursement for AEC devices due to a lack of evidence. In this case, the minimal evidence available suggested AT devices were predominantly being abandoned, and this provided rationale to cease provision. Obvious, obviously, there is a critical need to provide reputable AT outcome data to these parties. Processes that require appealing a large percentage of devices to obtain authorization for payments becomes not only inefficient, but impossible to continue in the long term. A faster mechanism must be made available for funding authorization for specific and unique situations. In common with other stakeholders, funding agencies seek the evidence of positive outcomes. The problem is that while successful individual patient outcomes are occurring, they are predominantly undocumented or unavailable. An effort must be undertaken to systematically record these outcomes. Otherwise, researchers, funders, and the AT industry have virtually no way to summarize the evidence. Current use of evidence-based medicine, evidence-based practice. From 1993 to 2000, the Journal of the American Medical Association published a series of 25 articles on evidence-based medicine that launched a paradigm shift. Evidence-based me medicine developed into evidence-based practice and launched similar concepts in education, including the U.S. Department of Education's special education programs promoting what works. Interestingly, the methodology of evidence-based practice has evolved and recognized an important concept related to disability and AT. In the fourth issue of the 25 article series, a hierarchy of the level evidence met methodologies was presented. Group data with inferential statistical outcomes were considered the state of the science, with RCT placed at the top of the hierarchy. 21 issues later, in the last issue of the series, the hierarchy was revised with a significant caveat. The authors of the evidence-based medicine, JAMA series, placed N equals 1 RCT at the top of the hierarchy, thereby acknowledging an extraordinary point. The authors explain and place in context that individuals have differences and are sometimes not re represented in groups, group data, or group design. Next slide. This in no way undermines the importance of the group RCT gold standard, but clearly highlights the challenge in AT outcomes documentation due to the extraordinary variability of people with disability. However, double-blinded RCT studies using N equals 1 design are virtually impossible in rehabilitation and AT, 
because individuals obviously know what the intervention is. And it can, it can be very difficult to blind the researchers to the assistive technology device as well. Designs using N equals 1 that do not require double blinding may be an ideal method for providing experimental evidence in the AT field. Evidence-based practice. As mentioned, N equals 1 trials as indicators that the invention works for the individuals may also provide the most important clinical evidence. While N equals 1 is not appropriate for pharmacological medical models, no methodology is better suited to a unique individual using a unique AT, assistive technology device. Recently, protocols for conducting robust single-case experimental designs have emerged. Further meta-analyses techniques for single-case experimental designs are emerging that could allow large collections of these to gain standing as legitimate evidence for AT outcomes. Evidence-based funding. Third-party funding agencies have quickly embraced the concept of evidence-based practice and operationalized decision-making around evidence-based funding. However, cases are proliferating throughout the nation depicting situations where funding systems are being virtually shut off due to the lack of the most robust level of evidence to support the success of using any given AT intervention. Interestingly enough, evidence-based funding has had an impact not only on the funding of devices for people with disabilities at the final stages of the provision of effective technology, but also has affected the policy side of funding that authorizes certification, billing codes, or approval protocols. This negatively impacts the entrepreneurial R&D cycle of the AT industry. On the delivery side, service providers and consumers are directly affected through the reduced access to, innovate, to innovative AT products built to address the needs of the target population and manufacturers, and R&D operations are affected on the product development side. As nationwide constraints in funding increase the need for accountability and documentation of outcomes related to AT device pro provision and services, we need to be cognizant of how the demand for the most robust, robust standards of evidence extensively affects all stakeholders in the field. Next, I'm going to have a case example on coding trends. Uh, to il illustrate some of the difficulties manufacturers clinicians and consumers are currently experiencing. The following is an example of a current Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, coding trend that highlights the difficulty in obtaining a new HCPCS code for a new AT product. A negative impact of this trend is that many products cannot be reimbursed at the proper level, and without proper coding and reimbursement, the product is not going to be available to the broad market that relies on third-party payment. An example of this is the Natural Fit Rims case study. This product is an ergonomically designed hand rim for a wheelchair designed to offer a conservative treatment for the wrist pain experienced by wheelchair users who have carpal tunnel syndrome due to injuries incurred through their use of the traditional round uh, shaped push rim uh, over many years. In 2005, CMS denied establishing a new code for this technology and stated, and I quote, testimonials and summaries of articles provided by the applicant do not demonstrate a significant therapeutic distinction between the category of items described by E2205 and the item in the coding request, unquote. The company, Three Rivers, was advised to use the existing code E2205, handrim, any type without projections, replacement only. From 1993 until December 2004, there actually were three HCPCS codes to address different hand rim technology. K0059, which was plastic coated hand rims, K0060, which were steel, and K0061, which were aluminum. The aluminum hand, rails, hand rims excuse me, were the only ones that were not separately billable with the wheelchair. In 2005, CMS crosswalked these three codes into E2205, creating a code that essentially grouped all hand rims 
without projections in the same code and eliminated any ability to bill any additional amounts with these hand rims. Next slide. In 2007, following the completion of a clinical trial that was requested by CMS, by the way, in 2005, uh, it was reported in a peer-reviewed journal with documentation uh, of the effectiveness of the hand rim in obviating CTS symptoms. The company then applied for a fourth time to obtain a unique HixPix code for the natural fin rims. The CMS work group decision again was that the E2205 code was adequate for this technology and stated in their preliminary decision, and I quote, clinical information provided by the applicant does not include evidence that would support a claim of superior clinical outcome when using this device as compared with other devices categorized at E2205, end quote. However, this time CMS took an additional step and revised the definition of code E2205 to hand room without projections any type, including ergonomic or contoured, in effect, natural fit, and it was for replacement only. The merging of multiple codes into single codes and adding any type to code definitions creates an access barrier to important technologies and reduces access to unique products. This is especially true when these types of coding changes eliminate all ability to bill for an item. It is important to understand the critical need to separately codify disparate, disparate technology that serves different clinical needs. This is necessary to facilitate development of appropriate coverage and payment policies. In addition, without a mechanism within the HixPix code set for identifying and distinguishing technological differences that are designed to serve different clinical needs, it becomes extremely difficult to support comparative effectiveness research. It is unreasonable to expect studies to be conducted to compare every product within a code. Without clear delineation and definitions of products, it becomes impossible to design studies that provide the evidence needed by medical professionals or policymakers to inform decisions. Next, I'm going in to go into recommendations from our KT DRR working group. And the first is a, a NITER, our first recommendation is a NITER funded RERC on assistive technology outcomes. At this particular moment in time, with NITER moving from the U.S. Department of Education to the Department of Health and Human Services, or HHS, NITER now has an opportunity to provide guidance to the AT community on the standards of AT device efficacy needed for AT reimbursement. This effort would provide HHS with the data it needs to base its ongoing and future coverage, coverage and policy decisions on. HHS is now the overarching agency which has oversight over both CMS and NIDR. With its agency restructuring, our group recommends that NIDR fund an RERC on assistive technology outcomes to address this void. Through our discussions on data analysis of current trends and future projections, we agreed that the restructuring offers a new opportunity for intra-agency dialogue. Such dialogue would result in a research agenda and framework through which HHS coverage and payment policies can be based and are based on NIDR-driven research and outcomes measurement. One tool or methodology that the working group believes is a viable option within the field of assistive technology is the development of a database of assistive technology usage and outcomes. This database would impose a standardized and systematic collection of before and after information inputted by both clinicians and researchers. Once the outcomes of assistive technology can be aggreg aggregated, there will be a greater likelihood of research acceptance and funding. Regarding the format for this database, we suggest using a minimal data set for the data collection for example, a 10-question format. While the minimum data set would be required, there will also be places for individuals to expand on their information. In addition, we strongly feel that there should be both pre- and post-assessments as part of the process. The post-assessment should be recorded for at least 30 days after the equipment is given to allow enough time for the consumer to use and understand the benefits and drawbacks of the equipment. 
to ensure these assessments occur, outcome data should be part of the process, as seen as being required in the state of Ohio. There, the special education department offered to fund assistive technology devices for the students, but only if pre- and post-assessments were part of the process. Managing repeated measures data. An additional consideration for use uh, of the eight assistive technology outcomes database is data collection for research purposes. When users select this option, they will be required to register in their intent to conduct a research study, whether it be pre or post, uh, single case experimental design, also known as single subject design in this field, uh, repeated measures, or an RC RCT. These applications will require additional data fields to properly describe the data, and this required flexibility will be explored during development. Security and privacy of the database. The author of said database must, at a minimum, comply with the HIPAA requirements for covered information, though ideally they should seek to provide even higher levels of security and privacy. All communication with the cloud servers should be performed using HTTPS. And for those that don't know what HTTPS is, it is Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure. And as such, the information would be encrypted in transit. In addition, data will be encrypted at rest. Uh, privacy control will be designed into the database layer, such as storing personally identifying information, person's name, social security number, address, in separate tables or even in a different database. All data access will be logged to create an audit trail, allowing effective affected users to be contacted in case of a security breach. However, there are some issues surrounding the use of the database. First, in addition to CMS, there needs to be buy-in from other third-party payers. It will be necessary to work with third-party payers to ensure that the correct data is being collected and that it will be of sufficient evidence so that reimbursement will be a possibility. A second possible challenge will be for the service providers and consumers to input the information into the, data into the database. However, we feel that through altruism and interest in contribution to the field, this shouldn't be an issue for service providers. Perhaps more importantly, the information that will result from the collection of the data will streamline the therapist's job, thereby providing enough payback to justify a therapist taking the time to input the data. For consumers, we feel that for a short information request, they will not need an incentive because of the benefits to the field. For more detailed information, a small monetary incentive may be required. In addition, it is important that the details of the information are properly recorded to ensure similar conditions when aggregating the data. Big data, still under uh, recommendation of the KT for KTDRR working group. AT devices and services, as previously discussed, have numerous variables that affect their outcome. This wide spectrum of variables makes AT outcomes so difficult to quantify. From a scientific standpoint, covariates are enticing to work with when data are collected on the variables and large data sets are available. Given the uniqueness of people with disability and the AT system they use, sufficient aggregate data sets are not only elusive, but often completely impractical given today's data collection methodologies and research financing. However, as previously presented, the data collection methodologies have dramatically shifted on a paradigm level, creating the potential of an aggregate data sets that are large and can compile data from individuals who are geographically disparate and seemingly unique. Sophisticated databases can identify like individuals and users of AT systems with a sufficiently sophisticated data collection methodology. This concept of big data spaces is not entirely new. NIH and NSF have indicated their interest in the usefulness of big databases through the launch of extensive research initiatives. This is in part due to the increased capacity of researchers to evaluate complex, multifactorial, high-quality data sets to examine relationships. Statisticians and methodologists have developed new quantitative analysis systems 
and data mining methodologies and are in the process of continuing to improve these analyses. The supercomputing era and the need for complex variable decisions and reporting have helped move this science forward. Even the White House has identified the importance of big data for understanding and discovering important phenomena that affect people throughout the nation. The importance of big data for understanding AT outcomes is that the complexity of variables for individuals creates small data sets for the many thousands of AT interventions. Consequently, researchers tackling an AT intervention must accumulate research groups of participants that may only consist of 5, 10, 30, or 50 widely scattered individuals. This makes it not only unlikely, but almost impossible for many research questions to be answered considering feasible funding levels. The concept of big data collected by individuals throughout the nation and the world using 24-7 uh, by 24 7 mobile data collection devices enables a new AT outcomes methodology that has never been possible before. While the immediate advantages are apparent uh, for researchers and scientists, this has also become a boon to service providers and consumers who may desire to look up people in similar situations to see what types of interventions have been used and how successful they have been. While numerous websites and apps have recently involved, including federally supported programs such as Able Data that solicit consumer feedbacks on assistive technology devices, these systems have only been used minimally. And these systems have minimal data regarding user context or elicitation of common coding variables for comparison. The environment is ready for a more accessible and complete approach. Immersion of community participation as outcome measure. The International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health, better known as ICF, provides an important framework for characterizing functional limitations and intervention outcomes. The model is comprised of three non-hierarchical levels which are influenced by mediating factors. The levels of the model are body functions and structures, uh, which considers impairments in anatomical structures and function. Activity, which considers execution of a particular task in an idealized context. And three, participation, which considers engagement in real life situations. Each of these levels can be influenced by contextual factors, personal and environmental, specific to the individual. Numerous measures are emerging that use community participation as an outcome measure for AT use. The ICF classification system allows for coding that can be applied to many different assessments and measures and can be seen as a bridge language for disability researchers wishing to compare data. These elements of change have created an environment of possibility that can allow the field to revolutionize the way it collects, aggregates, and reports AT outcome data. While the ICF provides a new framework, which goes a long way to embrace the need for a medical social model to describe and ultimately measure the effectiveness of goods and services designed to meet the needs of, of persons with a disability, current third-party policies, uh, third-party payer policies, are restricted to meeting the needs of a person just in the home and only covered if medically necessary without description of functional needs. With that, I will turn the next section over to Don. We'll go over uh, our recommendations from a legislative standpoint. Don? Thanks, Jim. And will you be able to uh, do the slides? Um, yes, I will. As we move through, great. Um, one of the things that we've talked about is, is the problems that uh, Jim is uh, discussing related access to assistive technology you know, is a lack of really awareness and appreciation. And while we've been working with uh, the related policymakers, CMS and other agencies, the need for legislation uh, has presented itself because, frankly, that will, I think, give the policymakers a greater sense of direction uh, and urgency to address these types of areas. Um, so using legislation, uh, federal legislation, working with members of Congress and the respective committees is one way that we can accomplish uh, uh, some of the recommendations we're making and also address some of the areas that uh, need attention. Um, the 
representatives from the industry, for example, from the RESNA Government Affairs Committee, uh, can work on this uh, along with other interested parties and work on creating uh, an infrastructure that would address some of the needs uh, that we've identified in the session today. Uh, next slide, Jim. Yep. Uh, one of the things that we actually have acted on is relating to complex rehab technology, which in the context of the legislation that's been introduced relates to uh, medically necessary and individually configured devices that require uh, special evaluation, configuration, assembly, and programming. Uh, the initial focus is around specialized seating and mobility, so specialized wheelchairs and seating systems, along with other types of equipment such as standing devices and gait trainers. And because of the issues that we've been facing now for several years that would fall under the coding coverage and payment categories, legislation has been introduced that uh, the hope is to address these types of things. Uh, as uh, the slide indicates, these items uh, are right now uh, classified within the durable medical equipment or DME category relative to Medicare policy. And that really presents a problem because there's a broad array of products uh, falling under the heading of medical equipment that fall into the DME category. But these complex rehab technology devices have a really uh, a much higher level of service, a higher level of complexity, both in terms of the product, uh, how it's provided, and the person who uses it, depending on their disability. So what we're looking to do is, through legislation, uh, improve the environment and protect access for the specialized equipment. The name of the legislation is the Ensuring Access to Quality Complex Rehab Technology Act of 2013. Uh, there's a variety of information that's available, uh, and I maybe would just take a minute to reference a website that folks could find uh, more detail on it. it the website is www.access to crt.org, so www.access, the number two, crt.org, which will have a, the actual legislation along with a lot of background information that folks may find helpful. Uh, but for today, if we review the basic premise of the legislation, we're looking at addressing some of the coverage policies uh, that really don't uh, address or recognize the unique, unique needs of people with disabilities that use this equipment. We're looking for a more formal recognition of the services that are involved in that, uh, because many times the technology is looked at as just a product that literally uh, someone gets dropped off at their front porch and now they're ready to use it, versus something that is provided through a very extensive evaluation process, requires uh, using different products from different manufacturers to come up with really uh, more of a system for that particular person so that they can uh, meet their medical needs and also maximize their independence and function through the use of technology. Uh, we're looking at providing a more stable payment environment because as Jim had mentioned, you know, one of the concerns is relative to product development. And if there's not an environment that fosters research and development. Uh, and from a business perspective, that means having a market for products that can be brought uh, uh, into reality that would benefit from people with disabilities. There needs to be some stability to provide that incentive to uh, manufacturers and other researchers to focus on this area and see what improvements could be made. Um, and then we're also looking at the uh, taking this system once it would be implemented within the Medicare program, and, and I should emphasize that, that this is focused on the Medicare program to start with, but the idea is once Medicare would adopt these changes, uh, in some cases other payers, state Medicaid programs, and private insurers automatically adopt Medicare policy, uh, and for those that don't, we would be able to then go to those Medicaid programs and other payers and encourage them to adopt something that Medicare has determined to be a, a, a appropriate system with safeguards and appropriate funding and coverage. 
the changes uh, relate to several different areas re relative to products and coding. Uh, what we're looking to do is take a look at the existing HICPIX codes, which is the billing code that's used for these products, uh, and identify which products are contain complex rehab technology and indicating or identifying those items or those codes as only being available through qualified CRT companies. And these companies would go through a formal accreditation process. So you would make sure that, again, uh, this complex technology is being provided through a system that ensures the best outcomes for the uh, Medicare beneficiary. Um, where there are not codes, uh, where where there are codes that right now include both CRT items and non-CRT items or more standard DME items, CMS would create new codes to separate that. So again, you would have the separation of the specialized CRT item from the more standard DME item. And then finally, uh, codes that were, if there's items that currently don't have a code, codes would be created for those. The next area relates to coverage and documentation. Uh, and again, this would be an examination of the people that use, a better examination of the people that use this equipment and what changes are necessary. Uh, in some cases, coverage is limited to a very uh, specific diagnosis or other limiting characteristics. And there's not a, a full uh, attention given to the functional ability of the person and the functional um, uh, improvement that that person could have through this use of technology. So we're looking to move away from a purely specific diagnosis criteria to also include consideration of a person's functional abilities and limitations. Um, and then also as a further safeguard around the mobility and seating side, there would be a requirement that if someone was going to be receiving a complex rehab technology mobility device. And just as a reference point within the Medicare program, the complex wheelchairs, both manual and power, comprise about 7% of all the wheelchairs that Medicare provides on an annual basis. So again, it's a small group of products, but they're highly specialized and they're used by uh, the Medicare beneficiaries that have the higher levels of disability. So they would be required to go through a more formal evaluation through a PT or OT uh, setting uh, that would Im improve the safeguards around making sure people get the right equipment. Then we're also looking to address supplier quality standards. Uh, this would relate to the providers that are actually um, supplying the products to the customer. And some of these things are uh, in place uh, to some degree within the Medicare program already. But what the legislation is looking to do is to enhance and really increase some of these safeguards, again, to provide better protection for both the Medicare beneficiary and for the Medicare program. Um, so one of the things is that the uh, uh, CRT company would have to employ a qualified rehab technology professional. This would be the person that would be working with the clinical team and with the beneficiary to identify uh, to their medical needs and to match those needs to the uh, technology. Uh, that person would have to have a higher level of credential than what they currently have. And then another area that we're looking to bolster is the area around wheelchair repairs. Uh, this is a, a problematic area because of very low reimbursement, uh, very high operational challenges in terms of companies having to have properly trained people maintain the right uh, uh, inventory. And unfortunately, because of these challenges, many companies have gotten out of the repair business. And this is a real problem for consumers because they, uh, once they get their wheelchair, as you would imagine, they're using it on a daily basis. And like anything, it requires repair and maintenance. They need to have a company that they can go to to provide that support. And we're looking at increasing the uh, uh, requirements and responsibilities around that. Thank you, Don. Uh, sure. With that, I guess we'll get to the conclusion section uh, of our presentation. Uh, in conclusion, our AT working group discussed the uh, current situation as well as issues surrounding the reimbursement of assistive technology for each of the five major stakeholder groups. 
because of the lack of sufficient research needed for reimbursement, uh, we had the following recommendations. We felt that an interagency HHS conference with agencies who determine coverage and, and pay payment policy, namely CMS, and who can provide research data, namely NIDR, is needed to consider and define the hierarchy of evidence needed for uh, the following. Uh, the determination of the safety and effectiveness uh, of AT, the determination of the best clinical practice guidelines, the appropriateness and practicality of data collection methods for the field to collect evidence, and the uh, potential utilization and promotion uh, of a national AT outcomes database. Our group also felt that legislative action was needed to define the types of assistive technology that are designed to meet the long-term needs for, for a person with a disability, separate from the policies governing broad, durable medical equipment to, apply, to allow improved recognition and policies. Legislative action is also needed to shift the AT reimbursement model's emphasis from a purely medical model to a model that considers the social and functional context of the AT user using the ACS. Our group also felt that research funding agencies need to support projects that address the scientific and practical challenges of obtaining and reporting sufficient evidence to make appropriate coverage, coding and payment policies for a small field that has a historical life-changing impact on people with disabilities. This webcast and its accompanying white paper have provided the necessary background information and suggestions for conceptual models that can be used to implement these proposed changes. With that, uh, I thank you for participating in our webcast, and I would like to turn it back over to Anne at this point. Anne. Sure thing. Thank you very much, Jim and Don, for that for sharing the process and results of the efforts of the AT Working Group. Uh, as we get ready to wrap things up today, I also want to thank our audience for participating this afternoon. We wanted to let you know that you can download the white paper from the webcast information page on the Center on KTDRR's website, and that link is provided on the, on the screen here. And we also want to invite your comments and feedback on today's session. One way is to fill out the brief online evaluation form. We'll send an email with the evaluation link to everyone who registered for today's webcast. And the link is also available on the webcast information page. You may contact us by email if you have any questions. And to do so, you can send it to Joanne Starks. And her email is joann.starks at org, And we'll be sure that it gets to Jim and other members of the AT Working Group. Um, and thanks again to Jim Leahy and Don Clayback and to all the members of the AT Working Group. We also want to thank NIDR for its support of the Center on KTDRR and this working group, as well as other center activities. We look forward to your participa participation in the future. And with that, we will sign up. So have a good afternoon. <laughs>